Hello, and thank you for joining us for this very special question and answer session with our keepers. My name is Steve, and I'm joined by three of our excellent keepers here at the park. And today we're going to be talking all about conservation, not just what it means, um, but also how, as a safari park and zoo um, here at Longley, we um, are involved in conservation, both on the park uh, and also in the wild. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to our three keepers that we have here, uh, starting with Lauren, who works with a lot of our um, birds and primates here on the park. Uh, then next we have Sam, who works with our small animals and invertebrates. And then finally we have Graham, who heads up our animal adventure team. Um, and Graham has also spearheaded the relationship we have with Australia and our southern koalas. Um, so I'm going to start with the first question um, aimed at Graham. Can you talk to us a bit more about um, what conservation might be? Tell me what it actually means to you. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's a really difficult term to pinpoint exactly what it means. But the, the, the real gist of it is that every single person is involved in animal conservation in some part of their daily lives. Whether that is what you buy from the supermarkets, whether that's what you do when you're outside doing a, you know, walking your dog or, or going for a nice hill walk or whether you're, you're on a day-to-day -day, um, work. Now, we're really fortunate that the work that we do, it directly impacts animals that we look after. It, it, we, we are really privileged to be able to work with some incredible species that some people have never even seen in the wild, never even heard about in the wild. So we're really lucky. Um, and we get to work with international organizations worldwide to try and protect the animals in, individually, but also the habitats that they live in. So the pressures that a lot of wildlife are under from changes in environment, such as the climate change that we're all going through at the moment, but also uh, pressure from um, deforestation, from poaching, from disease. Conservation is, is a, an umbrella that we use to um, conserve what we have at the moment, conserve what is there in the wild, and where possible, try and reintroduce animals that are really critical to the life cycle in certain areas back into those areas as well. So, it's, it's quite a broad term and, and I suppose we do our little bit here and, and we encourage you guys at home to do even just a tiny little bit yourselves um, to, to help wildlife and to help the environment as well. Thank you very much, Graham. That's a, a great start. Um, so we're going to talk in more detail about some of the animals that we're kind of directly involved in the conservation projects. But um, Lauren, kind of broadly speaking, what is our kind of our role as a zoo or safari park? Uh, in international conservation, how do we do it? So zoos and safari parks like us, um, it's hard to explain kind of how we can help these wild animals out around the world while we're here in the middle of Wiltshire, but there's, there's a few ways that, that zoos do help um, really actively involved in conservation. Uh, so one of the main ways is through education. So when our visitors come into the park and they see these animals firsthand, it's, it's the best way to inspire them and to see them up close is the best way to teach them about them and the visitors get to watch their keeper talks and they learn, learn a lot through that and that's what makes them think more I think about the animals out in the world. It's, it's more relatable when you've seen them firsthand and heard the facts from the keepers that look after them as well. Uh, another way that we are actively involved in conservation is through breeding programs. So when you see all the, the baby animals around the park there's actually a lot of work behind the scenes that goes into that, deciding which animals breed and when and why. And basically these animals, who knows what they could be used for in the future. They, they are in captivity, but who knows what could happen. They may in the end go out back into the wild. It's a, it's a safety net that we've got that we have these animals here in captivity so that if anything happened to their wild counterparts, say a disease could, could wipe out a whole population, we could possibly have stock to repopulate. Uh, and another way that we are involved in conservation is through funding. So we actively raise money, help out charities, and those charities are involved in huge projects around the world that um, are actively involved in helping wild animals. So some of that money that's spent on your daily ticket entry and special events that we raise, that money will go to the actual conservation projects out in the, in the environment that the animals are from in the wild. Sam, I'm going to come to you for the next question. Lauren just touched upon um, breeding programmes that are important as part of conservation and we're involved in. Can you kind of tell us what, how a breeding programme works and um, how it's very important that we're all coordinated across the world or certainly in Europe yeah. and the UK to make that happen? 
Yeah, of course. Um, I think Laura made a really good point that actually breeding programs are a massive part of what we do. And I think if you think of a zoo and conservation, that is generally what you think of as us breeding endangered animals. Um, but it's not quite that simple. So all of our animals, especially our endangered animals, are mostly part of stud books. Um, and what that means is there will be a specialist keeper in that area, um, in a zoo. Normally we work with Europe, so normally a European keeper, um, who will have essentially a list of all the individual animals of that species that are kept in Europe. Um, and it is their job to make sure that they create the perfect partners so they can match up the best possible breeding pairs um, to give us the healthiest offspring. So a lot of our breeding programs, we, we don't just get two animals and pop them together. Um, there's months and in some cases years of hard work that go into pairing them up. Um, so it's very important to make sure that we don't just put two together um, and there's a lot more that goes into it behind the scenes than that. On that uh, subject, uh, Lauren, I'm going to come back to you um, to talk about some of the international breeding programmes we're part of. Um, can you kind of give us a, an example of some of the species that, that you kind of work with that um, we're involved with? Yeah, so we've, um, we've actually had quite a few successes at the park here um, with our bird species. So one of the species I work with is the pinkback pelicans that are out in the safari drive through uh, and Longeek was actually one of the first collections to hatch an egg from, from these species. Uh, and we hand reared it and it was, yeah, a really long process to get them to breed. And we learned a lot from them. Um, and from that information that we gathered, it's gone on to help other collections. And now we actually have a group of pelicans that are parent rearing their own chicks. So it's, it's a long process to get them breeding. It was nearly 20 years now of work to put towards it. But yeah, we've now managed to actually rear quite a few chicks, which is a, a great success for their species. And Sam, while we're talking about successful breeding programmes, why don't you talk to us a bit more about the red pandas um, who you look after? Because um, I understand we've had a really successful breeding programme um, internationally uh, with them as well. Yeah, we've had great success at the park with red pandas, actually. Uh, we've had six cubs over the last five years that have grown up um, and gone other on a, onto other collections. Um, and one of our cubs that we have bred here has actually gone to the Netherlands and now had cubs himself. Um, so that's kind of how the whole chain works. Our babies have gone and had babies. Um, and some of those cubs have actually made their way back to the UK. So these animals are transferred all around Europe to make the best possible genetics. And we all have to work together and um, it's not just Longley, it's zoos all across Europe and of course across the world that work together. But we've also had great success with other animals that you may not think of, um, such as our desert ass wolf spiders um, and recently our aardvarks and our armadillos. Um, so although the red pandas are incredible and definitely my favourites, we also work with a lot of smaller species as well which are just as important to conservation as a whole. Breeding programmes aren't necessarily all just about breeding and there are challenges um, we face with it. Um, Graham, do you want to just touch upon that and tell us a bit more about why there is more to it? Yeah, you've got to think about what an animal does in the wild. So um, gorillas are a really nice example for us. Like gorillas are big family units, um, but they have the space to split off when they have arguments. Uh, males can go off and start their own families. New females may come in, uh, you know, and, and it, it's an ever-changing beast. So what we have to try and do with all of our breeding programs um, is to make sure that we try and manage them as naturally as possible. So as Sam said, it's great to put A and B together and hope for babies, but sometimes it doesn't work. Um, but other times um, you maybe get a couple of years where your pair produces just boys and there's loads of boys in Europe. Um, so they all need to go somewhere. So the gorillas that, that Lauren works with are a really nice example where we've, we've made the decision to house males. We house the bachelor boys, the, the, the stud pack, um, so to speak. And basically we work very hard to get those boys living together, to form nice relationships. And that then frees up space in some of the other collections that, that allows space in their zoos to breed more. It's about managing the population. So some animals may be quite well represented. And as such, we choose to stop that lineage and, and uh, separate those pairs off so that, that there's not too many of one family. Um, and then also it depends on the demand from the wild as well. So certain species over the, the, the years, things like Svalski's horses, the, the Arabian oryx, um, and, and a lot of the smaller um, aquatic species as well, have started to be drip fed back into the wild now as well. So there is sometimes a demand on the programs to produce 
as many offspring as possible for possible reintroduction programs. Um, so, I mean, the giant otters are a really good example of that. We have a, we have a pair here, uh, and last year uh, and the year before, a couple of pairs from um, their lineage were actually sent back out to the, to the wild from their previous collection. So it's really, it's, it's really exciting for us to watch not only the animals develop and grow that we have here, but to see that potentially some of the animals that we look after on a day-to-day -day basis, their offsprings in, in two, three generations may actually go back out to the wild. And that's it's really rewarding for us as keepers, but it, it also reinforces that, that by having a good population of animals that are healthy, that are disease-free, that are well-natured and well-adapted to, to life in, in general, um, are, are suitable candidates for reintroduction. That we're not, we're not scraping around trying to find the last three animals left in the wild, that we can actually you know, work with the network of zoos that we have and say, right, we need some of the best individuals that we have to start new populations in, in protected areas out in the wild. So it's, it's a, it's a, the breeding po programs are a massive area that, that we, we partake in. Um, and it's really complex, um, but it does work. And it's, it's fascinating to be part of and really rewarding at the same time. And kind of um, talking about reintroducing species to the wild um, it, it, and the challenges involved that, and it is difficult. Um, Sam, I, I know kind of with red pandas, there's something to chit chat a bit more about on this. Do you want to just tell us a bit more? Yeah, it's actually quite an exciting point in red panda conservation at the moment. Um, we, there is a zoo in Darjeeling um, which are looking to re-release some red pandas into the wild, hopefully this year, um, which is an incredible step. Um, obviously that's not something that can just be done. This is something that is 10, 20 years in the making. Um, they're looking to re-release red pandas uh, that are radio collared. So they'll go out, they'll be closely monitored. And if those red pandas survive and do well, that paves the way for more red pandas to start slowly being reintroduced. Um, it's a lovely image to pop red pandas back in the wild, but unfortunately, as with a lot of species, there isn't an awful lot of wild for them to go back to. So at the moment, it's very important to slowly introduce new members so that the habitat that exists can support them rather than us just put 50 red pandas back in the wild, and actually there's not enough food for them. Um, so it's a real delicate balance to kind of slowly build that population back up, but incredibly exciting. And hopefully it gives the chance that red pandas that we do have in captivity in Europe, you know, their children, their great grandchildren may be candidates for release one day, um, which is a really exciting prospect. Uh, and kind of we're quite we get involved with the red panda network um don't yeah. we it's one of the the charities and organizations that um we try to work with um through funding uh, yeah. and you've actually been out to nepal um do you want to just chat to us a bit more about your experience and how we work with them a bit more yeah i mean we do, we do a lot with the red panda network we've been supporting them for about five years or so now um, and we've become quite heavily involved um, the reintroduction program I was just talking about, actually we have helped fund some of that forest replantation that those red pandas are being reintroduced to. So although we are all the way over in England, we can play quite an important role in that process from a distance. Um, as you say, I was very lucky to go out to Nepal firsthand and witness all the incredible work the Red Panda Network do. Um, absolutely amazing place. Uh, we managed to see wild red pandas, which as I'm sure you can imagine, it's not an easy thing to do. Um, but the conservation on the ground is just fantastic. Um, and one thing that I really learned in particular was the conservation, although it's all about the red pandas and that's very important, it's very much aimed at the people. Um, people in the pool are heavily reliant on the forest, which is just them trying to make their livelihood, but that does lead to deforestation. So one of the things that the Red Panda Network do is give them other options. So helping out that population of people dramatically reduces the impact in the red panda habitat which is a very cool thing to get your head around very important um, for conservation as a whole and of course red pandas are very cute and fluffy and luckily you know a lot of people want to conserve them and we're really waking up to that now but they also signify a really important place in the habitat as a whole and um, so where red pandas live there are also pangolins there are also endangered birds and insect species so saving a red panda actually plays a really important role in saving that entire ecosystem. They're what we would call a flagship animal and actually by saving them we kind of help save an entire environment um, which is pretty mind-blowing I think. Yeah it certainly is. 
Um, we obviously support um, a number of um, uh, charities and organisations um, that support wildlife out in the wild. And I know another one of them is Tusk, who we've worked with for, I think, 15 years plus now, uh, and we support. Um, Lauren, do you want to just talk to us a bit more about Tusk and, and some of the things that we've done before? Yeah, so Tusk is a charity that was founded in the 1990s. Um, and over the course of that time, they've raised over 30 million pounds for conservation. They actually, they do a lot of projects uh, looking after a lot of different species and areas. And yeah, as you said, we've been working with them now for over 15 years. And I think in that time, we've raised over 150,000 pounds to, to help them out and help these projects. So it's, it's an amazing charity. They do a lot of work and it's, it's good to see that we can be involved in, in projects that are related to our animals as well. Yeah, certainly, I know one of the projects that Tusk support and that we've actually been heavily involved in is Lewa, uh, which is a wildlife conservancy in Kenya. Um, and they do anything from um, getting rangers to stop the, the poaching, sorry, of rhinos. Um, but also uh, they have monitoring services, they help um, increase numbers. They also work for local communities and education of those people that live in those environments. So it's more than just kind of looking after the animals themselves as we've talked about with red pandas it's the environment habitats um, and the people that live in those areas um, also being able to uh, come on board with protecting the wildlife and the environment into the future one of our more, more recent kind of introductions in terms of partnerships has been over in australia or southern australia to be precise and graham you've spearheaded our partnership with the um, South Australian government um, and the koala project we have on park. Tell us all about that. Yeah, it's, it, it's been a, a hugely fascinating project to be involved in and still be involved in uh, now. Um, and it's, it's very complex, very much like the work we do in, in Africa with Tusk and what we do in Nepal with the Red Panda Network. It's about people, it's about communities. Um, and the interesting one for this is that it's Australia. So it's an area that a lot of people don't think needs conserving. It's an area that people think, well, they're quite a wealthy country. Why do they need outside involvement? Well, they face similar pressures to all the other continents around the world in terms of disease, in terms of, um, I mean, as you'd have seen the bushfires last year. Um, but also what's really interesting about the Australian side of things is the uniqueness of some of the species. They're, they're almost, uh, they're an island. They're almost completely um, separated from the rest of the world in terms of the species that they have and the uniqueness of what they have. Uh, and what we find with the koalas is those adaptations um, are very specific to things like eucalyptus eating or the way that they produce offspring with a pouch like a, like a kangaroo has um, that, that make them um, quite vulnerable. Um, so koalas particularly, um, their loss of habitat through the bushfires, through um, you know, man expanding into the natural habitat through roadways between the, the eucalyptus forests causes them some real um, aggravation and, and does, does um, reduce the species numbers, certainly in the northern parts of Australia. And in the southern parts of Australia where we work, we have a lot of disease problems. So we have a very small genetic diversity of wild koalas that, that only came from six or eight individuals many years ago. Um, that then end up having a lot of disease issues with things like uh, oxalate necrosis, which is a kidney condition, with chlamydia, with, with leukemias and cancers. So, so really koalas are at, at such a pivotal point right now. So, so we're working really closely with the South Australian government with um, what is currently known as the International Koala Centre of Excellence, but it's soon to change over to koala life. Um, koalas are a really critical part of the ecosystem. So, you protect koalas, you protect the habitat. In doing so, you protect the, the, the dunarks and the cockatoos and the wallabies and the potteroos and everything else that lives in the eucalypt forests. So for us, they're a really nice flagship species that people get very passionate about. Um, and our project over the last few years has worked quite heavily on uh, koala genetics, has worked on bushfire recovery work. Um, we were really fortunate last year to be able to go out and help with some of the rescue work during uh, some of the worst fires they've seen in, in many years in Australia. So it's, uh, yeah, we're very, I keep saying very fortunate. We, we're always really grateful to, to be able to play our small role in, in any of these projects, whether it's in Africa and Nepal, in Australia, or, or even in Europe where we work. Um, so yeah, it's, it's just a, it's a, an absolutely massive project. So yeah, I, I suppose for me as well, get involved, you know, find out more about some of the projects that we work in uh, outside of this, this, uh, this Zoom call. 
um, yeah, it's they're they're really amazing amazing projects that we that we all take part in. Thank you, Graham. Um, we're, we're beginning to run out of time. We're mm -hmm. almost at the end of our Q and A. Lauren, I'm going to come to you because um, vultures um, are incredibly um, at risk and endangered at the moment. I believe. Um, do you want to just give us an update on their status and and why? Yeah, so vultures as a whole are one of the most critically endangered species around the world. Just the last 20, 30 years has, has really been, um, been affected by, by human activities. Um, we here at Longleat have African whiteback vultures, which are critically endangered, um, and we are part of the breeding programme for them. Uh, and recently, over the few years, we've been trying to get them to breed, and we've had, we've had some successes. We have had chicks here at the park. Um, we've been working closely with other collections to, uh, as we said, bring in different individuals and swap individuals because collections have realized that if you bring in new individuals to your group it actually seems to spur them on to breed so by swapping our individuals around it's really helping get the numbers up and um, so yeah fingers crossed we'll be able to help and get our numbers up so our final question for you graham because we've talked a lot about um international conservation and animals in africa um in asia and also in australasia but um, actually, native species, they're just as important to look after and conserve and tell us a bit more about uh, native uh, conservation. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, I think native conservation, especially at the moment when, when a lot of people are, are locked down at home and they've got their back gardens to, to keep an eye on, native, native species conservation is hugely important. And it's very easy to focus in on a red panda and a koala and a vulture in Africa where it's exotic and it's exciting. And we forget about things like hedgehogs and frogs um, and even some of the larger mammal species, some of the foxes and badgers and uh, uh, beavers and red squirrels and all sorts of things that are happening in the UK at the moment. Um, but also the plant life, you know, the, the, the um, woodlands that, that we have around the UK are some of the, the oldest woodlands that even that we have in Europe. They're, they're incredible, incredible habitats for wildlife. So we're really lucky here that we sit on a 10,000 uh, hectare estate. It's an enormous piece of um, of lovely Wiltshire countryside that allows us to uh, manage our woodlands sustainably so that we create really good environments for, for the native wildlife. It also um, encourages our farmers to, to farm uh, sustainably. We look at making sure our waterways are kept clear. We, we, everything that we do on site is about increasing biodiversity, as well as that Cheddar Gorge, which is the other site we manage. We manage um, a huge population of native bats within the caves themselves as well as uh, rare orchids, rare flowers, and, and um, rare lichens that we find around the site. So it's not just, um, like we said earlier, it's not just about the individual animals, it's about the habitat. And the UK and, and European conservation is, is a great way to do that, is to manage the plant life, the woodlands, nice native species, hedgerows, allowing areas to be wild for wildlife. And we try and do as much as possible of that on site, as well as using local ecologists and, and action groups to monitor some of the wildlife that we have here and looking at where possible do animals need extra support. So things like bird box schemes or bat box schemes, but also looking at where some of the wildlife is living that, that we directly input into. So our cave systems where we have rare cave spiders and horseshoe bats, right up to the top cliffs of, of Cheddar Gorge where we have the rare orchids and the, the, the pink flowers up there as well. So there's a huge amount of wildlife, not only just on the Lonely Estate, but, but wider in your own gardens and the walks that you, go, you guys go on. So it's about sustainable living. It's about trying to reduce our impact on, on nature. And then where possible, where the zoos and the, the, the local organizations and the wildlife groups are working really hard is to get those ecosystems that we used to have, wetlands predominantly, but also the, the canals and the, the woodlands and the open plain pastures back into good state again so that the wildlife can start coming back in. We, we're looking really to join up corridors. We want to get as much wildlife back into the UK as possible. And, and that starts not only in your own back garden, but on the Longley Estate where we work in, in the wildlife that we manage and in the future reintroduction programs as well. So yeah, British wildlife is, is hugely, it, you know, it's hugely important, not just for our own country, but it's hugely important for the generations that come after us to still experience some of those animals that that we grew up loving and seeing the red kites soaring around again and the hedgehogs in your back garden in the evening. So it's, yeah, it's, it's important that we look after our own back garden as well as, as international as well. Graham, that's a, a great end, I think, to this Q&A. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for all of you for speaking so passionately 
um, about conservation today. Um, obviously, these are just a, it's just a small snippet of the things that we're involved in at Long Leads, and everyone is around the kind of the world. But um, don't forget, we can all be involved in conservation in some form, whether it's from just recycling at home, things like car sharing, saving electricity by switching off any unwanted lights around the house. And Graham, as you touched upon, um, wildlife and conservation, we've got our back gardens, it's everywhere around us. We've all kind of got a, a duty to kind of look after it and love it. Um, so on that note, goodbye everyone. Thank you very much.